pediatrician. I'm a general pediatrician from Chicago. I also run the I'm, I also run the uh, Chicago Skeptics uh, organization in Chicago and the the uh, uh, Chicago Skeptics website and getting all that together. Um, but my entree into the whole skeptical thing was basically the science-based medicine aspects of um, skepticism and. Uh, as a pediatrician, I think that maybe the natural thing that I would talk about would be vaccines, because that's been such a big, big issue. But because it's been such a big, big issue, I feel like we've heard it a lot, and those of us who are interested absorb it, and those people who aren't interested don't absorb it so much, they skip it. Um, but um, I thought I would do something else, something that I've got an opportunity to do that a lot of people don't. I, every day, I get to talk to people about science versus pseudoscience just one-on-one. -on -one. You know, people who come in with very different beliefs from me and try to explain uh, what evidence-based medicine is uh, to people who've never dealt with the concept before. Um, I was going to do this with a glass of wine in my hand because it started to become a theme that um, <laughs> <laughs> I do presentations like this. I'm kind of going for the, the Christopher Hitchens of pediatrics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that would be an amazing selling point. <laughs> Um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit was what I've learned about communicating one-on-one -on -one from a skeptical perspective without alienating people. Um, every, every day, or every week, I do prenatal consults, co uh, prenatal consults. People who come in, they're all bubbly, they're happy, they're going to have a kid, they're going to adopt a kid, they're excited. Um, they come in and want to know what, what we as a practice will do for them. Um, these are excited, eager, earnest folks who really only want to do the best for their kid. You know, they, they have this little baby coming up. Um, and they have a little list of questions that they printed out from parents.com, and they usually start with something like, tell me about your practice. Um, being kind of a facts-based person and having gone to all these skeptics meetings for the last couple of years, I, I think that my communication style was fading a little bit, and I was like, well, we try to be a very science-based practice. Uh, we're focused on keeping our, active, our treatments uh, in line with current scientific evidence. Information on pediatrics, pediatrics changes frequently. Blah, 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 blah. And by this point, they're asleep. Um, <laughs> then the conversation goes on. The vaccine question does inevitably come up about, I would say about 60 to 60% 60 of the time. Uh, vaccine question. How does your practice handle vaccines? Um, Again, I started out with information overload. I would, I would just go off in my little spiel. Oh, well, there's this great Finnish study that shows the rates of autism, blah, blah, blah. There was the PCR that Andrew Wakefield used was contaminated. And, um, you know, that Marisol was removed years ago. People listened for like a minute and then... Um, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, uh, worse yet, <laughs> um, in fact, I'm it actually that's right before they walk out. That's, yeah. um, usually, that's okay with me. Um, but because you know, because of the communication thing, I was thinking maybe I should just change my practice to these guys because they stay very attentive. <laughs> very handy. Um, so, although the information I give during the, during the prenatal consults is accurate and um, voluminous and good evidence-based stuff. It also uh, is very information heavy, and I think it kind of comes across as me, doctor, me, give good science. You know, who is me? Um, where, and they've tuned out by the time I say, we're a, a tight knit family organization. We care about you, we care about your kids, your development, their whole, you know, lives. But they've tuned out because they're born. Um, like you. Um, so, What's in it for you? You guys aren't going to be doing a lot of prenatal consults. No. Many of you. Um, many of you have some sort of skeptical issue which you're passionate about, and you regularly deal, deal with folks that don't share your beliefs, but you'd like to have an effective conversation with them. So these are some of the tips that I've just gotten from real-life interactions that might help obtain goals and improve communication. And being a huge topic, I'll cover it entirely in the next 10 minutes. Um, uh, oh, I dropped this. Um, I've tried to just pick a few of the most important points, and, and the sentence that was there was, if you don't 
if you think that you're a wonderful, warm communicator, I'm sure you are. I, I was sure I was too, but there were certain things that I found myself doing that it, it took a real <laughs> self-realization to realize I was doing. While it's a talk on communication, this is a talk on one-on-one -on -one communication, obviously it's not a talk on public speaking, because I'm not a public speaker. Um, communicating isn't just keeping the facts, it's, it's connecting with people. If people don't feel like you're at least partially on their team, they'll mute you out. Um, appealing on an emotional basis is not discarding your rational side. If you don't connect emotionally with people, we're going to lose a lot of people to rationality. Um, one of the things that I think is prevalent among discussions and skeptics is the plural of anecdote is not data. No, but anecdote is a great intro to evidence. Um, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't do a lot of skepticism stuff, you don't have to throw all the facts at them right away. Um, there's a the big difference is using anecdotes as, um, as an entree, as, a, as an example, as an explanation or a clarification, as opposed to using the anecdote as evidence. Um, anecdotes are fine for illustrating a point or adding more oomph to what you want to say. Um, and it's, I think it's fair to use them instead of a dry scientific explanation when nobody wants to hear the scientific explanation. Um, people, you know, some people want, you know, the whole thing, and some people just want to see that. We don't want to see that today. It's a nice question. <laughs> <laughs> like um, so, I, I, uh, I, at first I didn't, I tried to really avoid using anecdotes in, in some of my discussions with patients, but, um, there are certain things that you have to tell people that maybe an anecdote can help clarify things or push your point a little bit. Um, when I discuss vaccine side effects, I've got my little regular spiel. The most common side effects of vaccines are fever and fussiness in the next two or three days. Um, but rare side effects could be uh, an allergic reaction. So if your baby had any swelling, difficulty breathing, hives, you take them to the emergency room. And then anecdote. But I've never seen that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go on. But you're, you have a, about a 1 in 15,000 chance of a seizure, which doesn't cause any neurologic damage, which would be scary when you take the emergency room. But I've never seen a patient w with a seizure. It's, it's anecdotal. They don't know what my N is. They don't know if I've seen 10 patients or 100,000. They don't know how meaningful my anecdote is. But what I think it did is um, it's, it's given them the, the data they need along with the reassurance um, that these things are just not that common, uh, even, if, even if it was using anecdote. Um, keep it simple. Um, normal people don't memorize lists of logical fallacies. <laughs> Telling them that they're offering an argument from authority or using ad hoc ergo propter hoc, they don't. They um, if you have a lot of lines of evidence for your point of view, use the punchiest to make your point. Don't go with the driest. Watch out for jargon. You know, we all have our own jargon in our different industries or our different interests. Um, and this is pretty much what I used to say, which was, there was this great Finnish study, which because Finland has socialized medicine, was able to look at the medical records of hundreds of thousands of children and determine that there is no statistically significant difference in rates of autism between those who received the MMR and those who didn't. And in fact, if you're willing to look at the raw numbers without looking at whether or not statistical significance would reach the actual number of cases of autism is lower than the group who got the MMR. Well, I've lost people several places. Socialism, that's, the, you know, it doesn't bother me, but it bothers a lot of people, and they've stopped listening at that point. Um, statistically significant. You know, a, a large number of my patients know what that means, but it doesn't mean they're not gonna tune it out when I start talking about it, uh, and it's wordy. So, simple. There was a great study comparing rates of autism among thousands of kids who did or did not get MMR, and there was no difference in the rates of autism. MMR was not associated with more autism. It's less information, but it's more memorable. Um, don't be afraid to be definitive sometimes. We're, you know, especially in science, we're, we're always saying, you know, mostly, usually, often. You know, I said it, it wasn't associated with, it's not. It's not associated with it. I can give them caveats if we're going to have a more in-depth conversation, but you don't have to do that at first. 